to welcome you back to these uh, middle of the day sessions. And our first session of the middle day is going to be uh, Manfred Steyer's uh, The Micro Front End Revolution Using Webpack 5 Module Federation with Angular. Um, Manfred, as you can see, um, he's here right beside me. Um, he's an Angular expert and he knows a lot about Angular. So, and before I give you into his very capable hands, I want to um, and, uh, you to know to the uh, site chat and question tool of uh, Swapcard. If there are any questions or anecdotes, you can use them there. You can also use it for applause, for instance. And then Manfred, take them away. <laughs> All right, I mute myself now. Have fun, enjoy the session. Okay. Yeah, so thanks, you. Thanks for having me. As my colleague told you, this is about micro frontends and Angular and module federation. And you know, this whole stuff is about architecture and design, technical design. And I want to start with a very special kind of technical design, namely with this one here. This is a helicopter that has been designed by the genius Leonardo da Vinci in 1400 something. In 1400 something. The thing is, he only designed it because he didn't have the right material for building it. But as scientists found out recently, now as we have the material, we can build it and it really would fly. And this is somehow a nice story because in the area of micro front end, we have a very similar situation. You know, micro front ends are about building individual front ends, like this one here, and loading them into a common shell so that the user has the impression that they work with one integrated solution, but in real, they are working with several different applications that perhaps have been created by different teams. And here, like with the helicopter of Leonardo da Vinci, we have this idea for quite a long time. This idea has been around for almost five years, but so far we didn't have good materials to build something like this. But this is changing now with Webpack Module Federation. Webpack Module Federation introduced with version five allows you to load a part of a completely different system. That means you can implement different micro frontends, different teams can work on it, they can publish them, and then you load everything into a common shell. Yeah, and this is what this presentation here is about. I will start with module federation, I will give you an overview, and then I will talk about federated Angular. This is using module federation together with Angular and with the Angular CLI. We talk about dynamic module federation, which is about loading micro front ends that have not been even known at compile time. They are just known at runtime. For instance, I could use a lookup service informing me about this or that micro front end I should load me. I'm talking about version mismatches. What happens if we have two incompatible versions of a library in two micro front ends we are loading into our shell? And then I will give you a possible roadmap so that you know when you can use all of this together. Let me also introduce myself. I am Manfred. I'm a trainer and consultant for Angular. I'm doing a lot of in house trainings and during pandemics, I'm doing them remotely. And my focus is Angular for big enterprise scale applications. For this, I uh, transport a lot of advanced topics. And besides this, I'm quite connected to the Angular community. I live in Austria. I do a lot of stuff in Germany. And I'm always happy if I can work together with people in other countries remotely or on site. Okay, let's get started with an overview of module federation. Module federation is answering one big question, namely how to load separately compiled, separately developed, separately deployed source code. And perhaps you are saying, well, come on, Manfred, that cannot be that difficult. 
because we have this dynamic import statement. So why not use it to point to another application in order to load something from over there? Yeah, in theory, that would work. In practice, this doesn't work because of Webpack and all the other bundling solutions out there. And it does not even work with the Angular CLI because the Angular CLI is using Webpack. The reason why it doesn't work is that Webpack and all the other bundling solutions assume that everything is here at runtime and also at compile time. That means everything is compiled together. Everything is compiled together. Everything is optimized together. Think about reshaking, for instance. And only then, after everything was optimized and compiled together, Webpack splits your source code into chunks for lazy loading. And obviously, as everything has to be known at compile time, loading something that hasn't been known, loading something that has compiled separately, deployed separately, is not possible here, at least not without dirty tricks. But module federation is changing this. Module federation defines two roles. The first role is the host, also called the shell in the area of micro frontends. The other role is the remote, I'm calling it the micro frontend. Both roles get the configuration. For instance, the shell can be configured with an URL, a URL MFE1. It stands here for micro frontend one, and it points over to the micro frontend that has been separately compiled. You could define an alias here. You could say, hey, what's called MFE1 on my side is called MFE1 or Manfred or Batman or Bruce Wayne on the other side. So you could use an alias. Here I'm using a non-alias. It's called MFE1 on both sides. On the other side, within your micro frontend, you can expose stuff. You can say, hey, I'm exposing this component, this service, or this Angular module. Here, I'm exposing a component, and this component gets the official name CMB. And then something beautiful happens. If you have done that, you can import something from over there by using the map names. If you go with MFE1 slash CMB, you point over there and you grab, in this case, the component that has been exposed. And so, without telling Angular about micro frontends, you load something that has been separately compiled. Angular doesn't even know about this. For Angular, this is just lazy loading. We are fetching an URL. But Webpack underneath the covers knows, hey, now I have to do my special module federation trick to load something from another destination. Of course, you need some metadata about your micro frontends, for instance, the URL. And that's why when the micro frontend is built, Webpack emits a remote entry file. This remote entry file is just a tiny JavaScript file just a few lines of code. It is really not big. If you open it with an editor, it has about one screen page. You don't even need to scroll. And this remote entry needs to be loaded into the host. You can do it with a script tag like here. You can do it in a more dynamic way. For instance, there is something called dynamic federation and if you go with dynamic federation, you use the Webpack runtime API at runtime to load all the metadata and to load also the micro front ends in question. After loading this remote entry point, the shell knows where to find the micro front end and how to fetch it. Also, you can share libraries. For instance, you could say, hey, I'm sharing Angular core. I'm sharing it on the left side, I'm sharing it on the right side, and that means that Angular Core is only loaded once. It is not loaded twice if you have two micro frontends. It isn't loaded 10 times if you have 10 micro frontends. This is a very powerful feature, 
And even as you will see in some minutes, in the case of a version conflict, there are several strategies implemented in the module federation for dealing with them. Okay, so you have seen module federation is quite simple and powerful. Just configure that specific URLs point to another destination to a separately compiled and deployed application. But now the big question is how to use all of this together with Angular and the CLI? Because in Angular and the CLI, Webpack is not directly used, is abstracted by Angular and the CLI. But the good message is, even though it's, it's abstracted, behind the Angular CLI, we have a Webpack instance. Normally, it is shielded from us. Normally, we have not a way to deal directly with it. And in most cases, this is a good message. Because in most cases, we don't want to deal with the complexity of Webpack. We just want to say, hey, CLI, please build this application and the CLI is saying, yes, I will build it. But in this very case, we want to directly deal with Webpack underneath the covers because now we have a module federation conflict. And somehow we need to find a way to squeeze it into Webpack, to squeeze it into the CLI-based configuration for Webpack, the CLI generator. And this can be done. For this, we can use a custom builder. Custom builders are there since Angular CLI 6. It allows us to modify the way the CLI is building our applications. By default, the CLI is using a builder delegating to Webpack. And we could now write a custom builder that first of all merges this configuration into the Webpack configuration generated by the CLI. And then it could delegate to the default builder, which is creating the application, building the application with Webpack. You could write this by hand. It's about, I would say, 50 lines of code and some boilerplate around it to make it work together with the CLI. But you don't need to do because I've already done it. I've implemented this Angular Architects Module Federation Builder. And it does exactly three things for you. First of all, it generates the skeleton for a module federation config. That means you don't need to learn this config by heart. You have it here. You can comment out what you don't need, or you can comment in the parts you really need for your shell or for your microphone. Then it installs a custom builder, which delegates your configuration to Webpack underneath the covers. And then it also, it assigns a board, a unique board to your Angular JSON so that you can actually serve several micro frontends side by side. The usage of it is quite easy because it comes with a bunch of schematics. Just Angie add it to your application. In this case, I'm Angie adding it to my project. And then perhaps it is asking me questions about the board to use or about the project I want to enable for a module federation. Then we need to adjust the generated configuration. And then we can Angie serve everything, our shell and our micro frontends. Let's have a look into this. So in this example, I have already start, started and shell. And you see, when I'm clicking at flights, I'm seeing a message that tells me that nothing has been implemented so far. Yeah, nothing has implemented because this is my task now during the session. But I also have a micro front end. It runs on localhost 3000. And now the goal is to load this micro front end from localhost 3000 into this route, which comes from localhost 5000. Okay, let's do this. For this, I have prepared a Windows terminal. And in this Windows terminal, my shell is running. And in the second tab, my micro front end is running. So let's close the CLI. 
let's also close this CLI and let's getting started with enabling the shell for module federation. And she add Angular Architects module federation. This is about the project shell and it's about the board 5000. Shoot. And now, as you see, it generates the skeleton for the module federation config. It is a partial webpack config and it registers my builder within AngularJSON so that the webpack config is respected by Angular and the CLI. I'm doing the same over there for the micro front end. Let me copy this. This is for the micro front end one, and the board here should be 3000. And one more time, the same thing happens. Okay, great. So now let's have a look into the source code. Let's start with the micro front end one, MFE one. Let's drill into it. Here we see a webpack configuration. It is just a partial webpack configuration. You see, it's not big. It only consists of things we need for module federation, like a public path. We don't need to assign this public path, but it has some advantages. For instance, assume you want to load a picture from over there. Over there, perhaps the picture is located in assets, my picture PNG. Of course, if we load this into, let's say, localhost 5000, we need to fully qualify this path. We need to add this public path to it to load the picture from over there where also the bundles have been located. And that's why it might be interesting and important to define the public path. If you solve this issue by yourself, then you don't need to set the public path. It's up to you. It is just an option. Also, we need to set a unique name. Normally, there is a good default value for this unique name. It is the name within the package JSON. But if we have a mono repository, we only have one package JSON and several micro frontends. And so to prevent that we get the same name for each and every micro front end, it's a good idea to set it by hand to a unique value. This here is needed for the time being because uh, I'm currently using a beta version of the CLI. Hopefully we don't need it when CLI 11 becomes stable. And then the most important thing here is the module federation plugin. This is used to configure my remotes and my shell. Let's get started with the remote. Let's get started with my micro front end. My micro front end is called MFE1. This is the name of my remote entry file with all the metadata for the shell. And I want to expose a module which comes from flights and it's called flights module TS. If you look into this flights module TS, you see this is just a module with child routes. We don't need this stuff here. This is just for the shell, but I am defining that I want to share those libraries. I don't want to load them several lines. Okay, this is the configuration for the micro front end. Perhaps you are wondering now how I, man how I managed to use uh, Webpack 5 together with the CLI. Well, the answer is, if you look into my package JSON, currently I'm using a beta version of the CLI. I'm using the next six version, which is about beta six. And this version allows us to opt into Webpack 5. By default, it comes with uh, Webpack 4, because it has been optimized and highly tested with Webpack 4, but we can opt into Webpack 5 by using this resolution section here. This tells Jan to always go with Webpack 5 
even though the other dependencies depend upon another version. That means for the time being, we should install uh, everything using Yarn. Yeah. As mentioned, this is a beta version. Hopefully the final version of uh, the CLI 11 will work quite nicely with Webpack 5. Currently, it is good enough for playing around with it, for doing prototypes, and hopefully this will be improved until it's shipped as the official version 11. Cool, okay, so now we have found out how to load Webpack 5 into our CLI. We have found out how to configure our micro frontend. Now let's also configure our shell for this, I'm moving to my projects folder for the shell. And also here, we've got a Webpack configuration. We have the same wedge tables here. We have uh, the public path, and we have a unique name, and we have this runtime check. We need to bypass a path for the beta version. And we have here the module federation plugin. Let's get rid of this here. Here for the shell, I only need my list with remotes, which means I need to point to this or that micro front end. And if I want, I can directly assign the URL, which leads to the equivalent remote entry point. It's not necessary. This can be done in a far more dynamic way, but I think for debugging and testing, this is the easiest way to get started. So let's stick with it. Also, I want to share this or that library here. After that, let's move into our app roots file of the shell. Here you see, I can introduce a lazy root, a lazy root which is loading a module from this bar. And this is really funny because one more time, this shows that Angular itself does not even know that we are doing micro frontend. For Angular, this is just lazy loading. Webpack is doing the heavy lifting underneath the covers. That means we don't need a special meta framework that routes between applications. No, we just use Angular as always and Webpack makes sure everything works. Webpack makes sure it will resolve this mapped path at runtime. But TypeScript is a bit uh, annoyed because TypeScript doesn't know about this path upfront. And yeah, TypeScript is right. This path doesn't exist upfront. It only exists at runtime. And so it would be a good idea to ease TypeScript, to tell TypeScript, please don't throw an error. Uh, please. Uh, be aware of at runtime, everything will be okay. For this, you just need a file that ends with TTS. For instance, here I've called it declarations TTS, and you can put uh, typings into it. Typings like this one, which is telling TypeScript, hey, come on, this will work at runtime. Do not throw an error at compile time. When moving back, we see now for TypeScript, this is fully okay. Okay, that's it. Now, hopefully, we've implemented a first micro front end solution. Let's move back to the console. Let's here now start the shell and she serve shell. And in the second tab, we can serve the micro front end. Of course, in real world, I would use a script like concurrently or a script included in uh, an X, the an X mono repos to run everything side by side with one command. But when it comes to showing concepts, then I like to use as less magic as possible. So as we see here, the shell is started. The micro front end is started. Of course, we get some warnings, but you know, warnings are for hazards. Okay, we are talking here about uh, a beta version. So it should be fine. 
And now let's reload the shell. Perhaps you've already seen it when I'm clicking here. Hey, the micro front end is loaded from the other location. It is directly loaded into the working area. Let us have a look into the network tab to find out what happens here. I'm loading my application. And when I'm clicking here, just on demand, this additional chunk is loaded, common chess. This is the chunk with the uh, micro front end. And as you see here, it only has 12 Ks, 12.6 Ks. This proves that Angular isn't loaded twice. Angular is reused. Angular is only loaded once into the shell, and then it is shared with the uh, micro front end. Otherwise, this bundle size would be far bigger. Perhaps you're saying now, come on, Manfred, you are showing us lazy loading. No, I'm showing far more than lazy loading. Because when you look here, this is about localhost 3000. And if you look there, this is about localhost 5000. That means I'm really loading something that has not been known at compile time. I'm loading something from a different origin. Awesome. That was not possible before. And this is a very important key for micro frontends. But there is even more the module federation. There is a thing called dynamic module federation. So far, our shell needed to know which micro frontends are available. And then it loaded at least their, let's say, entry points when the application started. Their entry points to get an overview of everything. With dynamic module federation, you don't even need to declare the remotes upfront. You can just give web back the necessary metadata on demand. That means when your shell starts, it could communicate with the backend and the backend could inform it about the current micro frontends. Well, we have now this micro front end and that's micro front end. Please, my shell, provide a menu item for it. And then I can load those dynamic micro front ends with a helper function. Here I've created a helper function load remote module. It is leveraging the Webpack runtime API. In general, it is a good idea to abstract the Webpack runtime API. It is quite powerful, but it is quite low level. And so wrapping a nice function around it is a good idea. This function here takes the remote entry point in question from over there. It takes the name of the micro front end from over there. And it takes the exposed element, the exposed component, the exposed module, the exposed pipe from over there. Yeah, and then it returns the exposed element. Let us have a look to a demonstration for this. For this, I'm closing here my first example. Yes, I want to close it. Also this, and then let's move to another folder I've prepared. Yeah, and let's start this example. Now it takes us some seconds. You know, patience is a gift. Not a gift I have, but it's a gift. Was patience part of the Borussian properties? I don't know. But yeah, here we have it. So at first sight, this looks exactly like what we have seen before. We have a shell. And we can load the first micro front end. I call it my red micro front end, or the second micro front end. I'm calling it my blue micro front end. But as a matter of fact, this shell does not know about the micro front ends upfront. It is consuming a lookup service, and this lookup service provides all the metadata about the micro front ends on application start. It says, hey, shell. I have this entry point, and over this entry point, 
I am providing this remote and this remote exposes a module. And that other remote is exposing another module. This one comes from localhost 3001. This here comes from localhost 3000. So this is far more dynamic. Let's have a look into the source code. So within the source code, I have this helper function here. Let's treat it as a black box. This helper function that is loading the remote entry and the micro front end on demand. It just gets an options object. If we look into it, we see it points to the remote entry point, to the remote name like MFE1, and it also points to the exposed module. And then I have another utility method, which is building all my routes in a dynamic way. Yes, that's possible. You can create dynamic routes with Angular. And for this, I'm getting all the metadata I've got from the backend, from the lookup service. And look here, my metadata called options is mapped here. Each entry within the metadata is mapped to a route an Angular route, which has a specific path, which is using load children for lazy loading. Normally you use load children together with a dynamic import, with an ECMAScript 2017 import. Here, I'm using it together with my helper function remote module. It gets the options passed, it will load the module in question. This module is a TypeScript module, and as we all know, a TypeScript module can return several other building blocks. It can export several building blocks. And here, I'm just grabbing the right building block, namely my Angular module with child roots. Everything here is part of my metadata from the backend. Yeah, and this configuration I've built, this roots array will then be passed to the Angular router. Really straightforward. And so I don't even need to know the micro front ends up front. Okay, I have prepared a fourth topic for you. And I just see we are really good in time. So let's talk about it. This is about version mismatches. Just imagine you are sharing a library between micro front end one and the shell, but both of them need a different version of the library. Well, when it comes to this situation, Webpack module federation is very smart. It has a very smart default and the smart default is about using semantic versioning. That means by using semantic versioning, it tries to negotiate the highest compatible version. Version 10 on one side, version 10.1 on the other side, the highest compatible version according to Semver, according to semantic versioning is version 10.1. So this version is then used. If there is not a thing like a highest compatible version, we can fall back to an own version. In this case, by default, the first micro front end gets perhaps version 10, the other micro front end gets version 11. We can relax the accepted versions. I could say, hey, this micro front end is built with version 10, but I know because I've tested it, I've looked in my crystal fear, it also works with version 9. And so I could say, hey, let's accept also version 9. Or we could say, no, this is a singleton. We are only allowed to load one specific version. And if there is not a thing like a highest compatible version, then emit a warning or throw an error. You can configure this. Fail fast is this strategy. If something doesn't work, try to fail fast to prevent further issues during the execution of the application. I have prepared some thought experiments for you showing all of this in context. Let's assume I am sharing the lib called mylib and the shell needs version 10. And let's further assume micro front end one needs 10.1.1 and micro front end two needs version nine. 
So in this case, the shell and micro front end one will share the highest compatible version, which is version 10.1.1. By SEMVR, by semantic versioning, version 9 is not compatible to version 10. And so by default, we are falling back to version 9 for micro front end two. This is the default behavior. In many situations, this is a smart behavior. Of course, you have a bit of an overhead at runtime in terms of bundles that need to be loaded, but each and every application gets a version they can work with. You can also say, no, I only want to load one version of a library. And if there is not a thing like a highest compatible version, please throw an error or emit a message, emit a warning. This can be done that way. Here within my webpack configuration, I'm defining that my lib is a singleton, only one version is allowed, and strict version true means that an error is thrown. An error is thrown if there is not a highest compatible version found. Without strict version true, we would just get a warning. And we could relax the required versions. I could say, hey, I know we need version 10, but let's be true, no big breaking changes. It also works with everything in that range here between version one dot something and 11 dot something. So as you see here, module federation is really flexible when it comes to things like this. Okay, perhaps you really like module federation. Hopefully you like it as I do. And so the next question is, when can I have it? The good message here is Webpack 5 is final. So you can immediately start using Webpack 5. But we also need a CLI version that allows to use Webpack 5. The current beta version, also the current RC version, that has been released some days ago, allows us to opt into Webpack 5. It does not support all the features of Webpack 5, and it has some issues, but as mentioned, it's good enough to play around with it to create a first prototype, to have a look in the near future where everything will work seamlessly. Yeah, we can opt into it, but there are some restrictions. And hopefully when CLI 11 arrives in late fall, I guess in the course of the next month, we will have a CLI version that works seamlessly together with Webpack 5. Rumor says it will still be an opt-in because the Webpack team, no, because the CLI team cannot guarantee that everything works seamlessly without any breaking change. Perhaps uh, they will manage to implement everything seamlessly until CLI 12, which is due in spring 2021. But hopefully it will work good enough to get started with this. Okay, if you like this presentation, you might also like my ebook I've written about this topic. It also consists of topics around micro front ends, about module federation, it also contains further topics. And if you didn't like this presentation, check out my ebook anyway. Perhaps I'm writing better than I'm speaking. Who knows? Okay, let me come to a conclusion. What did we see today? We've seen that module federation is really a game changer. It's finally the right material we need to build our micro frontends, like with Leonardo da Vinci's helicopter. He designed it, but the right material was only available later. We can load separately deployed code. This is a big deal for micro frontends, and by the way, also for other plugin based system. We can use it together with Angular. We just need a custom builder which squeezes the Webpack configuration into the CLI. We can load everything dynamically, even the metadata, even the information about the micro front ends available can be loaded dynamically. This is what I've called dynamic module federation. 
And there are a lot of smart strategies for dealing with version mismatches. I'm really excited about that. And I hope so you are. Okay, thanks for having me. Here you'll find my contact data. I've already uploaded my slides and my uh, examples to my blog. And if you like, follow me on Twitter or on Facebook so that we can stay a bit in contact. Thanks for having me and have a nice conference. Okay, um, good. Uh, first, thank you for the lovely session, Manfred. And we also have uh, quite some questions in the chat that have um, accumulated. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is, does sharing of the Angular core libraries work or do all micro frontends have to be compiled with one version of Angular? Well, there are several answers to this question. So um, it would be nice if all the micro frontends used a compatible version so that there is one highest compatible version. That would be the best approach. Nevertheless, the Angular team guarantees us that a component compiled with version N still works with version N plus one. They don't talk much about it, but they guarantee this. This is also important when they are building NVM packages. Uh, another thing you might do if you really need to mix and match different Angular versions, you could wrap your Angular application as a, uh, as a web component. And in this case, you could load web components with module federation. And so it is not interesting for the shell, which technology the web component is using underneath the covers. Perhaps it's using the same Angular version. Perhaps it's using a different Angular version. Perhaps it's even using a different framework like React or Vue. So if you really need to combine different Angular versions, then loading web components would be a nice approach. Otherwise, you can use the approach I've shown you here. OK, thank you. Um, the second question is, can data be passed between micro frontends and the shell app? For example, would it be possible to use the search results of flight search micro frontend in the shell app itself? Yeah, uh, the short answer is yes, you can share data. You could use the window object, but please do it if you can avoid it. A uh, more beautiful approach would be to just use a shared service, a shared Angular service and check that here and there. You only need a common dependency injection token. But the thing is, please don't overdo it with sharing because it's funny, but sharing is somehow a contradiction to the goals of micro frontends because micro frontends are about loading something that has been developed in isolation. And on the other side, we want to share data, but for sharing data, we need to know each other. And so it's somehow a contradiction. Of course, you need to share some data, but please make sure you share as less as possible because if you don't share as less as possible, if you share too much, you have a too high coupling between your micro frontends. Okay. And uh, we also have a third question. Could you give a short example when you would use micro frontends, starting with a certain team size, e.g., what are your criteria? Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, it's also part of my story. It's not a free lunch. Micro frontends come with some disadvantages. Namely, you load something at runtime, you load something you didn't know at compile time, and somehow you have to make sure that those things that only meet at runtime work seamlessly <laughs> together. So if you don't need it, I wouldn't implement it. Most of the time, you will choose for micro frontends if there is more than one team. Because in this case, those teams can work individually. They don't influence each other and they can work on their parts. And nevertheless, it looks like one big integrated solution for the user. If you ask me, several teams is the main purpose. Another purpose could be if you have a big application, that needs to be evolved and extended for years or decades, not just maintained, extended. Because in this case, 
you could use another technology for the part you add in, let's say, seven years. In short term, you don't want to mix and match different frameworks because we don't want to have a framework zoo. It's not good for maintainability. But in mid or long term, it is really beneficial to move from an old technology to a newer one for a specific new part you have to implement. Okay, thank you. And the last question is, <clears throat> would you recommend the dynamic multi-frontend architecture for a role right group situation where different clients have access to different apps? I'm not sure if I really grasp this question. So different customers have access to different apps? Uh, perhaps this question needs to be clarified. Can you see the question in the chat? Because uh, I think we are also... I'm currently not there, but I will look it up, of course. I will okay. um, log into um, swap, swap thing. How is swap it called? <laughs> swap card, yeah. <laughs> After this uh, talk. And then I can, with pleasure, answer all the remaining questions. Thank you very much, Manfred. And of course, to, uh, to all other attendees, this swap card stays up for a whole year, so you can have access through the whole year out. And as Manfred already said, he is going to go back to the chat, so everything can be answered. All right. Then again, thanks for everyone. And uh, to the rest, enjoy the rest of the sessions. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.